Uh, running on a production, uh, running on a developer machine is easy. Running on a dev environment is easy. When, but when you productionize it, and when you're talking about running the mission critical workload, then it becomes a big challenge. And this is based on my experience because I've been working with big customers and especially the big banks, big four banks in Australia. And they have thousands of thousands of applications running on um, Kubernetes and AKS. And most of the things I collected out of the field experience so that I can share the best practices and best, best in our deployment pattern with the team. So, so a bit of uh, introduction of myself. My name is Advice, a bit of an uh, old uh, photo. I think I look uh, young on this photo, so I, I kept it. Um, yeah, I'm like, a, my role is a cloud solution architect working in Microsoft for about two years now. I have a strong development background. I can, as you can see that I started my career while it, I wrote my first code in assembly and C. I'm not that old, but it, this is how I started. And then Java when it was beta 1.0 and then Visual Basic, Visual C, and now a bunch of now latest technologies, Python and some other. I did not put that because it's just showing where I started, a bunch of certifications I have, uh, which are relevant for the industry plus many more. Now, what we are going to cover today. So we will have a bit of overview of AKS. Most of the people already know a Kubernetes, but just to want to give you a bit of high level overview of what the AKS is. Uh, we will discuss why we need to design the reliable system. Then we will discuss some of the design considerations, some of the best practices of how you design, you know, highly available and resilient uh, systems in a production environment. Then we will discuss some of the design patterns of deploying multi-zone and multi-region, some of the design patterns of deploying. Plus, we will discuss about some network latency considerations. These are mostly for the workload, which are mission critical workload, you know, high for which, for which you need the high performance. We will discuss some of the consideration. Then we will discuss about the application resiliency consideration because none of the discussion is completed till we discuss the application because at the end of the day, it is the application that you are running. Infrastructure is there, everything is there, but if the application is not performing, uh, it's end of the game. So we will discuss some of the resiliency consideration of application. And finally, we will discuss the monitoring because monitoring is the very important aspect of the whole cluster and you need to have the end-to-end -end monitoring. If you don't know what is happening in a cluster, then you can't take the proactive actions of fixing and doing something. We will discuss you know, how we can do end-to-end -end monitoring of the cluster. Now, let's move on to the first topic, which is the overview of Azure Kubernetes Service. Well, okay, so AKS, um, or Azure Kubernetes Service, a Microsoft managed Kubernetes platform. When I say Microsoft managed, that means a lot of things underlying infrastructure, patching, and other stuff is being managed by Microsoft. It is highly integrated to other Azure services like ACR, Azure Container Registry, plus Azure Disk, Azure File, and a bunch of other services of which are available in Azure. It is highly integrated to those. Some of the deployment, um, you, you can see that when you deploy, you deploy a bunch. Typically, when you deploy your application, you have a bunch of backend services, some plus front end services, plus the utility services. So this is just showing that just high level architecture. You're deploying the backend services. You have some utility service. You have AKS cluster. Then you have an ingress controller. This all deployed within your uh, cluster, Kubernetes cluster. Then you have a backing uh, services like an external data store plus. We're going to have a key wall monitoring, and then you're going to have a DevOps uh, pipeline through, you know, and you, you know, use the hand chart and other thing for the deployment. I move to the next one. Now, Kubernetes service, what it, it, what it provides. So it simplifies the development and management of the Kubernetes operation. Ease of deployment and um, management of the services on Kubernetes. Scale and run the application with confidence. So it's not only about scaling the application. It is also about the scaling the uh, cluster, all the underlying infrastructure. We will, we're going to dive into detail of about the clustering and, uh, and scaling and other stuff. Uh, it, it provides you the secure Kubernetes environment. Of course, it is you need the when you go to the production, you need to be secure. So it provides a secure environment, accelerate containerized deployment, um, and, and also you can use the open source. So even if you are using the managed AKS, managed Kubernetes, 
nothing is stopping the team to use the open source as well. There are a bunch of things which are available as an add-on. Like for example, Istio we just go on GA. Plus there are, if there is anything which is not available and as a managed service, you can use the open source tool or APIs. Plus you can set up a CI CD that's with the click of button. Element of orchestration, we, we know that when we talk about running the cluster, uh, running the Docker container, it is very simple. I can just uh, run on my own machine. But when we talk about production scale of running the Docker container, then you need something called orchestration. What orchestration is? It is about the scheduling. That means that where would I schedule my cluster if I have a bunch of nodes, like a bunch of, I have a cluster of node of four or five nodes, where would I run the um, pod? How would I run the pod? You know, and, and affinity or anti-affinity, should I run to this node or that node, or should these two pods be running together? Similarly, monitoring and failover, scaling and the networking, service discovery and the updates. These are the some of the common consideration which are required when you deploy your production uh, production scale container on, uh, onto the production environment. These are the things that, that are needed. So these orchestration elements are provided by the Kubernetes environment. Next, um, when I say manage Kubernetes, so there are things that, as I said, that manage Kubernetes, the manage cluster provides you, there are the things which is the uh, customer responsibility. The thing on the left side you can see here, if you do the DIY Kubernetes, DIY Kubernetes means you go and to your own environment or you go to the cloud, you spin a bunch of VMs and deploy the vanilla Kubernetes. If you do that, you can, but there are things that you need to consider like containerization, application integration, CICD, provisioning, application library scaling, monitoring, and logging. All of these things you need to take care of yourself. But if you use the managed environment, when I say manage, it is, you know, backed by some of the support pillars, you know, a lot of underlying things which are managed by Microsoft. So things like, for example, monitoring and logging, these are fully supported by Microsoft. Scaling, when I say scaling, it is the infrastructure scaling, underlying infrastructure. That has been taken care by Microsoft. Reliability, availability, um, provisioning, update and patches of the node CI, CD, now, up till here is the Microsoft responsibility, but now CI, CD things uh, on top of that, like CI, CD, application integration and debugging, containerization, these are the shared responsibility. Now, we all understand what the shared responsibility is. Um, in terms of deployment, it's very easy. You have a managed control plane. Um, you have an endpoint. You interact with the endpoint to deploy to the, uh, talk to the API endpoint, or it's called ATPI server, and which gets and the pods gets deployed into the bunch of the VMs, which are the nodes. Now, this is the cluster high-level architecture, just to give you uh, what is being managed by Microsoft and what's being managed by the customer. So, when we there are two uh, control planes uh, in Kubernetes. One is called um, managed control plane. Other is called Azure managed control plane. Other is uh, customer managed control plane. So, for the Azure managed control plane, the or the Kubernetes management component, which are API server, Etsy database, scheduler, these gets deployed into the Azure's own subscription. And these are like all managed by Microsoft in terms of availability, patching, and all sort of thing. The thing on the right side is the customer managed. So you your workload gets deployed into your own subscription. So it will be deployed to nodes, and the node pool, you define the node pool and the nodes. And on the nodes are just a bunch of VMs where the your containerized workload will be running. And these are some of the Kubernetes component like Kubelet, Container Runtime, Kubeproxy, which gets deployed into the node. And you deploy your container, in, uh, sorry, in a, uh, you deploy your code and container will be running within the pod. So this is just a high level architecture. Um, some of the additional benefit, of course, like you know, if you are running like a uh, there are two SKUs, like uh, there are like a free SKU, you can run free. So free means that um, <clears throat> you won't be paying for the control, managed control plane, which is the Microsoft Manage. You know, all the uh, management component, you won't be paying for that. You will be only paying for your uh, nodes consumption, you know, the, your own, uh, what's called, um, your own subscription, workload in your own subscription. 
um, man, uh, you can manage through the portal and all of the things CNC, uh, CNCF certified and it's complied with a lot of different, you know, SOC, ISO, PSI, EPA, a bunch of the others. I just put a few here. But if you go to the um, AKS or Azure uh, page documentation, you will find and if you will just support the AKS compliant, you will find a list of the compliance, you know, and the related documentation. Now, so that was the introduction of AKS, you know, just to, just to give you a brief overview of what the AKS is. Um, now, let's talk about why we need to design the reliable system. Okay, now in today's world, um, change is inevitable. You need to have a change. Change means what? Like change means production system change. You can't have a production system running long time, you know, and you don't do anything. For example, if you have an old legacy system, there may be some changes coming from the business. Or let's say if you don't do change, but there are there could be software vulnerabilities or you know that you need to fix. If you don't, then there will be a security issue. Example is the log forge is a recent example, right? There were hundreds of applications, old applications that nobody wanted to touch those applications, but the, when the log forge vulnerability came, then people have to do the change. So that means change is inevitable. When you do the change, there is a disruption. And it's not just the application change, it could be the platform change. For example, if you are deploying your application in your on-prem environment onto the VMs, let's say the old world, you know, and you need to do the, your like a server admin or system admin needs to do the OS patching. And that OS patching could break the system. And that's, I faced that, you know, in the old world, that another you know, system was running perfectly and they just deployed the patch and system was crashed and nobody knew what, what happened. And we had to spend only four or five hours just with the system admin, find out what was the problem and find out that there was a one DLL which would get deployed, which was incompatible with the one of the service because we were using the IAS, um, um, IAS and that was not compatible. So, what does it mean is that we have to be ready for the change and we should be able to design a system which can cope with the change. And it's also not only, yeah, so, and also like I gave the on-prem example, it could be the cloud example. For example, you are deploying uh, on a, let's say, AKS or VM on any cloud provider and that cloud provider always needs to do the platform changes. It happened, you know, the patches and all sort of thing happen. But we can't just assume that my system will be running all the, time, all the time, no interruption. It could happen. Or it could be, you know, deploying and then it could be like a issue with the region. For example, you're deploying a Sydney region. And if the region is down or one of the service in the region is down, then your application will be down. You, of course, you don't want that to happen. The, especially for the production system. So, when in system, let's talk about what the reliability resilience is. When we talk about the change, then two things we need to consider when we keep the change in mind that, that the, the change could happen and disruption could happen. So, two things we need to keep in mind reliability and resiliency. Reliability is what is, is making the system available all the time. In my example, let's say if I say that, okay, I deployed onto one VM. And my system was running on one VM, and then I, my system admin applied the patch, and system is down. That means system is not available. What if my application was running on two other VMs? So if one VM was down, the two other VMs were up and running, and that's my system overall was available. So this is the reliability with this example. So reliability means that making system available. Similarly, resilience is, is about how, is the way the production system can achieve the reliability. This is about responding to failure. Again, the failure is inevitable. Failure could happen. Our goal as a system designer or architect or developer is not to remove the failure or avoid the failure. It's to face the failure because failure could happen. There are a lot of examples that big, you know, for the big telco or big organizations, that a small change of the production system just put down the whole system. So. We need to design a system in a such a way that it can respond for the failure. We should adopt the failure, embrace the failure, and the system should be designed in such a way that it will heal itself 
when there is a failure on some of the system. We will see some of the techniques of doing that. So this is the difference between reliability and resiliency. Now, what happens when the bad things happen on the production system? It shows what usually what we have is a different layer of defense in our system, in our production system. For example, we have the technical layer, we have individual, we have teams, we have professional organization, institution, and we could have a different layer of protection within them. For example, if I have a DevOps, okay, I have a good quality gates, I have a good uh, test running, UAT, stress testing, all sort of test running, and then, but it could happen, and none of the uh, failure could happen. So what happen is, when we find the root cause of failure, there may be multiple root cause of the failure. It's not just one. So in your layer, this is showing you that in your defense, these are the defense layer. In your defense layer, you could have a hole. Anywhere you could have a hole. Our, our job is to minimize those holes so that we can minimize the root causes of the failure. For example, like if there is a, like a production issue and we find out, okay, the production issue is due to the bug in the system. Okay, that was the root cause, the major root cause, okay, technical root cause that, and then we go and fix it. But what was the hole in the layer before that? If we say, okay, one layer before that was my unit test or quality test, let's say, and we find out, okay, we, did we test, did we cover that scenario? Sometimes we find out we may not have covered that scenario or when developer did that change, he did not have time to actually uh, properly test it. Sometimes we face it, like in I face when I was a developer, when I used to do development, uh, we used to have very narrow window fixing the production bugs because it brings down the system, customer is waiting and I have to go and jump on the code and quickly fix it. Uh, and then you have a change request and then your manager is waiting for approving the change request. So what happened in this case? You may have fixed the bug, but you may have introduced another bug in the system, which may, you may not have tested, but when the time comes, that bug will come and will, it will bring down the system and you find out that, yeah, because of that issue, we were fixing that issue, we don't have time to fix this issue. And you know, these, so the point is that when the issue comes, there are multiple, multiple root causes. So our job is to minimize those. Like, uh, as I said, these holes, we need to minimize these defense holes in layers, the defense layer, hole in the defense layer. So when we talk about uh, building the reliable system, it is the shared responsibility. I can't say that, I can't tell my um, system admin, give me 10 VMs and my system will be reliable. Sorry, or I, I said that, okay, I'm deploying to the cloud. Okay, cloud will take care of all the infrastructure bit. Uh, my system will be resilient because I'm using the cloud because cloud providers saying that you deploy in the cloud, it will be highly available as you attain, blah, blah, blah. But at one end, it may be true, but it is their responsibility. They are doing one bit of it, but there are other bits which we are responsible. So thing like resilient foundation, this is your, platform. This is a cloud provider. So resilient provider uh, platform, Microsoft is investing a lot onto resilient platform, like in the, all the stuff like, you know, AKS or app service or VMs infrastructure or Azure Disk um, or Cosmos DB, whatever it, we talk about, those all deploy to resilient infrastructure. That is on the resilient foundation. So that is one part that's been taken care by the cloud providers. But how about the features? It is my responsibility to use those features. For example, the availability zone is there. Multi, I can deploy to multi-AZ or multi-region. So I'm talking about Sydney, or sorry, Australia. I know that I have two regions, Sydney and Melbourne. I talk about the Sydney. I know that I have three availability zones. So those are the features available as to deploy the resilient system. But who is responsible to use this feature? It's me my, like, or a customer. I am responsible to use that feature because Cloud provider can't say that go and use that feature. They can't mandate that. Similarly, the application, of course, I am responsible for my application. I need to design my application resilient to embrace the failure. It should be resilient. So, so it is the shared responsibility. All three layers we need to take care of because if I say, okay, I, 
I need 99.99% availability. Fine, but how would I achieve that? Have I designed my system to be 99.99% or like a five nines? Have I used the resiliency feature to be five nines? And how have I used those foundations to be five nines? So those are the things that we need to consider when we talk about end-to-end -end availability and resiliency. I take a little break here to just, just get a sip of water because my throat is, I don't know, just a weather thing or something. Cool. So those were the like a foundation or build up of what we want to discuss. We discuss about AKS, what the AKS is why we need the resilient system in today's world. Now let's talk about some of the design considerations. So these are the considerations for AKS specifically, but that can be applied for any of the application. Uh, if you're deploying onto the, let's say any other platform air, for example, you're deploying onto app service or you're deploying onto the VMs itself. <clears throat> let's dive into detail of those. Okay, now, first of all, the first thing I need to look at is cross region failover scenario. I, I have some patterns, we will discuss some patterns about that. But what it means is if I want to deploy mission critical high available system, then I need to consider zone availability, multi region. And I have a customer, it's a big bank. Um, they have thousands of mission critical application running. So what they have done is they deploy onto two region. They have one set of app running onto the Sydney region, they have another set of running onto the Melbourne region, and they have a multi AZ as well. So within the region, they have AZs that deploy into three AZs, plus they have an application running onto the Melbourne region, onto the multi AZ, and they're using global load balancer to fail over or just around the traffic to those. Uh, so they have a load balance global customer traffic comes. We will so see those patterns and then draw the traffic to wherever needs to. Plus, uh, second thing is the blue-green deployment, added safety and DR practice. This is a good practice. This is, a, this, is a, this is not just for the application, but also for the cluster upgrades. And again, as I said, like you know, my customer, they are using this blue-green technique. So whenever they do the cluster upgrade, they use the blue-green technique to upgrade the cluster so that it becomes highly available. Uh, Multi-AZ deployment region where it is available. So multi-AZ, let's say, if you don't want to go to the multi-region, fine. Then if you are want to stick to the one region, let's say Sydney region, then you should deploy onto the multi-AZ. And when you go to the AKS cluster, when you spin up your new cluster, it gives you the option of multi-AZ. Either you can select all three AZ or you can select one or two. So the idea is that you should be, when, this is about the production, of course. Uh, there's no harm you can do for non-prod, but especially for the prod, these are the practices that we should follow, especially when we deploy in the multi, uh, mission critical load. Cluster auto scaling for a node. Uh, this is about the cluster auto scaling. This is specific, specifically for the node. For example, if, if I have a node pool and I'm running the, like, uh, let's say, three nodes um, currently. Now, if the workload increase and then I have a lot of pods pending to be scheduled, then I have a cluster auto scaler and it will go and auto scale or spin up more nodes or VMs so that my um, ports will be deployed. So this is about the auto scaling of the node. And this is taking the proactive measure, not just the reactive. This is the proactive approach that the, your cluster is monitoring itself and it knows that more ports need to be deployed and I don't have the nodes to deploy. It will go spin up the nodes to deploy those ports. Similarly, uh, we have three things called horizontal auto scaler, vertical port auto scaler, and event driven auto scaling. Horizontal part of scale, auto scaler means that this is more for the application. So let's say if I'm deploying, if I'm running two ports for my application, and if I have a heavy load come onto my application, let's say high CPU or memory utilization gets increased. So I define a matrix and say that okay, if the memory utilization goes over 80%, go spin a more two, two, two more ports. So this is how I'm scaling my application or adding number of ports. Vertical auto scaler is vertical scaling. This is, um, this comes as an, um, 
um, as an add-on um, that you can use. So what does it mean is that if the CPU utilization of my particular port is going up, it will keep monitoring the CPU utilization or memory utilization of your port. And if it look at the pattern, if it continuously goes over, then it will change the deployment manifest file to increase the memory and CPU limit. So it will provide you more limit. For example, if you're using 500 MI for your port, and you, most of the time, your application is using, let's say, 700 MI. So what this will do is it will go and in change the deployment manifest to be 700 MI for that port. And then the Kubernetes schedule will go and update your port to use that memory limit. And even driven auto scaling, this is very interesting. Uh, in a production environment, you're not just running the port or your application. <clears throat> when we talk about event driven architecture, you have a queues, you have a Kafka maybe running, uh, you may be using event hub, and you may have a pattern that you are reading the messages from the queue and doing something. So let's, what if you have two consumer or two ports reading from the queue? And what if, if you have thousand, thousand messages coming in the queue? In that case, two ports or two instances of duplication would not be sufficient. So you need some sort of ability to increase the number of ports so that will start consuming those, uh, those messages. This is where the CADA comes in. Because CADA is just as comes as a plugin and it will look at your, um, depending upon which um, plugin you are using, if I using service bus, let's say, it will go and see how many messages are there and should I increase more or less. If, and that is all the configuration. So let's say if there are no messages coming, it will go and auto-scale your pulse. So this is what the CADA is. And there are, there's a long list of, I didn't put in here, but if you go to the, if you go to search and see the, look at the CADA um, plugin, you will find a long list. It's not just the Azure, it's AWS and some other Google and other um, plugins are available as well. <clears throat> now, when we talk about the design consideration of resilient and level architecture, we need to minimize the RTO with automation. Uh, this is very important and you need, should have the CICD or GitHub, some other. Um, we, we talk about the design and test for failure scenario. You should, we should embrace the failure. We, sh we cannot avoid the failure. We should embrace the failure. And the way to do it using the chaos engineering is test testing. I have something on the chaos engineering I will discuss in more detail. Uh, the, but the, just, uh, just for intro, the chaos engineering is a technique through which you can test your system with the, with the failure, against the potential failure. For example, against, let's say, memory pressure or CPU pressure. Those are the, like, or you can just bring down your instances and see that what, how your system would behave in that case. So that you can take proactive measure, you can design a system in such a way that when that particular failure comes, then you, your system will auto heal. Continuous improvement through observability in SRE. I will touch base on that. The next one is about, about the deployment. The first thing is about the pod disruption budget. So this is all about high, making your system highly available all in the context of that. So pod disruption budget ensures that the minimum number of pods is remaining avail remain available during the voluntary disruption, which is like an upgrade or accidental pod deletion. So what does it mean is like if we have, uh, let's say three pods running, and I say, I say that I need to have two pods available all the time if there is an update. So the Kubernetes will respect that and it will only evict the node if two ports are not available, things like that. Did I say, yep. So this is the port disruption budget. So, so this is the case, for example, you know that you, your application absolutely need X number of instances. For example, if your application absolutely need three instances or two instances all the time to serve the customer traffic, then you can define the PD, uh, PBD or PDB, I'm sorry, PDB for disruption budget to say that, okay, this number of ports should always be available regardless of what sort of upgrade you do. And Kubernetes respect that, as I said, when it, it evict the uh, node. The second thing is you should define a CPU and memory limit for all the ports. This is one of the bad practice I see a lot of time that uh, developers don't put like a memory and CPU limit into the into the deployment manifest. And what happened that if there is no default limits at the namespace level, then you are giving your port freedom that it could use the whole node's memory or whole node's CPU. 
by default it will happen that and, and agar if you don't have you have not defined the memory limit or quota so to prevent your pod to take up all the resources you need to define cpu memory limit but if you find out that you are in your organization developers keep missing or this uh, in in a in a manifest file what you can do is define the resource quota limit range at the namespace level this is what admin can do so admin can define the quota uh, resource quota for uh, the namespace level and limit la default limit range so default limit range is if there is no limit defined cpu memory into the manifest file the default will be applied so you can say that okay for all the pods i only allow 500 mi for example that's as a default this will help for the planning as well for the system admins because system admins can define the default limit and based on the default limit they can plan for the nodes x number of nodes and the, and also the resources for those nodes moving forward another way another thing is important consideration is pre stop hook for the graceful termination so in your manifest file you can define a pre stop hook so when your pod receive the termination message you may have something that you want to execute some script that you want to execute before pod gets terminated this is for the graceful shutdown and this is one of the uh, best practice or i would say one of the one of the design principle of 12 factor app is called this graceful shutdown of your cloud native application so in order to do the graceful shutdowns you should use the pre a pre uh, pre stop hook this will execute before the pod gets a stop similarly maximum available in the deployment file so maximum number of pod that can be available during the rolling upgrade this during the upgrades pod affinity and nt affinity should pod spread, spread across the node and pod should be these two things you can work together so what does it mean is let's say you have a multi node environment you have uh, four or five nodes running and you want certain pods to be deployed on certain nodes for example you know, let's say um, if you have one node pool one node uh, which is for gpu another node you you define for let's say less mission critical for example you know some sort of uh, internal apps let's say so you, what you can do is you can define the pod scheduling and then to the uh, pod affinity rules or nt affinity rule then you can say okay go and deploy my this pod this port to this node this port should go to this node or with the nt affinity you can say that okay this port should not be different on this node so it goes other way around so there are configs that you can do in a deployment manifest file to control the port scheduling <coughs> and this is very important when we we talk about the resiliency and high availability <coughs> another consideration is we should have the readiness liveness in startup probes to improve the application resiliency for the high workload and startup so these are the three different probes that you can define in your deployment manifest a startup readiness is 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 giving pod will give the signal that i am ready to take the traffic because sometimes what it happens is you deploy the pod and the pod may not be ready and you your load balancer will start sending the traffic but pod may not be ready in that case application will be unavailable so what you want to do is you need to have some sort of ability so to tell the like a uh, infrastructure that my pod is not ready at the moment because you can it may your pod may take some time you may have let's say in it uh, in it uh, con container running for example or some boot is trapping you are doing before you start the pod so you need to have some sort of ability to say that i'm ready or not ready so this is the probe that you use liveness is then is it live i am ready uh, can i detect the traffic it's all the time in you know, it just uh, is just that uh, just the kind of health check you know they said that i'm ready and a startup probe of course is about the kind of ready just the startup after startup will give the signal now another best practice is at least two replica of your application to achieve the high availability as you see so in order to achieve the high availability you need to have the num you need to increase the number of instances it goes exponentially um when it um, when talk, when i talk about number of nines for I, I, i don't have that slide so let's say if you are running one then it is let's say two nines for example but if you are running increase it to two instances you will increase to let's say three or four nines i, I don't remember at the moment but this how it goes and if you add another instance let's say three instances it will jump into the four nines or five nines 
So as many instances you add, you will add the availability. Of course, it comes with the drawb um, downside, which is about how you manage the application and a state and all sort of thing, you know. The defined power, uh, limits, we discussed that, but you need to enforce with the policy. So one thing we discussed is through the quota, that you can define the quota through at the namespace level. Another way you can enforce is through the Azure policy. So you can in, in the policy, you can define that if you're deploying the pod, you should have a resource um, limit. Um, you should have a limits defined in there. Otherwise, your pod will not be deployed. Now, another important aspect is separate application dedicated node pool based on a specific requirement. So uh, touch base on that. Uh, let's say you have GPU requirement. You have some nodes which need high um, memory, high CPU. So in that case, if you have a specialized workload requirement, rather than deploying your ports onto the mix of node, you should have a separate node pool and separate nodes for those ports so that you can allocate the resources properly. Otherwise, what could happen is, let's say, <clears throat> if I deploy my pod into the general node, let's say, and few of the pods need more memory, let's say, more resources, you will end up um, with resource starvation onto the node. And then what will happen is the Kubernetes will start uh, shutting down the instances of the, the pods so that we release the resource. So this is very important design consideration that you should have a dedicated node pool. Another one is the NAT gateway. Uh, if you have a lot of outbound connectivity, like if the pod needs to connect to the our internet, so you should use that. This is one of the good design principles that you should use the NAT gateway so that you have a more control onto the what is going out and who is which pod is connecting to what. Uh, some of the cluster level design consideration, multi-AZ deployment when creating AKS cluster and to ensure high availability. Uh, I talk about a multi instance of the application, but how about you're running three or four instance in one AZ? What if that AZ is go down? Even though I say that my application is highly available, but infrastructure was not highly available because if the one AZ is down, my application is down, even though I'm running three or four instances. So uh, what I should do is I should also deploy into the multiple AZ. So multi what the AZ is, is just a, it's, it's a separate kind of data center, a bunch of data center with a separate uh, heating and uh, power and all sort of stuff. And those are physically isolated as well. So if the one AZ is down, uh, my application will be up and running my other AZ. So what the design principle is, I should spread my instances onto multi-AZ. Let's say if I'm running three AZ, and if I'm running three instances of my pod, then I should be deploying all in each instance onto each of the AZ to achieve the high availability. <clears throat> and how would I schedule that? It's through the pod scheduling, which we saw in the previous slide. I can instruct Kubernetes to say that I am deploying three instances. I have three AZ. Go and deploy my each of the instances of each of the AZ to achieve the high availability. This is very easy configuration in Kubernetes. But the, there are things in my control that I can do to achieve the high availability. As I said, this is the shared responsibility, which we saw in one of the slides. So one of the shared responsibilities, okay, I <clears throat> is I deploy my application to three instances, but should should I deploy? Have I deployed to the, the three separate instances or three separate AZs? If I does, then yeah, I answer the question. But there are some other design considerations. But this is one of the important considerations. Another aspect of auto scaling, I think we touched base on this already. System node pool. So there are two node pools in Kubernetes. And if you remember the slide in which I show you the high level architecture of Kubernetes or AKS, there are two, um, I would say, deployments. One is the Microsoft Manage in which you have all kind of API server, etcd, those kind of things. And you have a, your own um, workload. So system node pool is all the system related ports that gets deployed to the system node pool. And user node pool is where your workload gets deployed. The best practice is that you should have at least two nodes per node pool for auto scaling. So three nodes per system node pool. You should have at least three instances of system node pool. When you spin up your request cluster, it's a configuration. Then you de define how many node pools you need for the system node pool. 
And the best practice is that you should have three, at least three instances of system node pool and two of the user node pool and without a scaling enabled. What does it mean is I should have more than two nodes for the system, uh, node, user node pool and more than at least three nodes for the system node pool and at least two nodes for the user node pool. And that should spread across the availability zone so that I will have the high availabilities. And I should also enable accelerated networking for to provide the low latency um, and high uh, decrease utilization of the VM. So this is available by default, um, good news. Um, this is accelerated networking is, is just to reduce the network um, chattiness and jitters or those kind of things. Another, some of the more design considerations, uh, I'm sure I have not bored everyone. Uh, some, these are the best practices I said, come up with the, with the, with the experience. Uh, image should not use the latest tags. So this is one of the bad, bad practice or that people use latest tag. Because what happened if you deploy the latest, and uh, if you have kind of uh, hook defined as you, you can do in an ACR that you can define the deployment hook. So what's going to happen whenever you deploy and push the latest, it will go and deploy to the cluster. Of course, you would not want to do that. So always, always use the tagging, image tagging, and deploy this perspective tag so that you will have a control of what image you are deploying. And when you deploy the, when you do the through the build, do the build of the um, image through the CI CD, so you can put the like a build number for the tag, and you can use that build number to deploy the image. Okay, there are uh, two tiers in Kubernetes. Um, AKS, sorry, uh, one is the standard, one is the free. So a standard tier, for, it's a, um, free tier is of course, there's no, it's like, a, it's not backed by the SLA. But when we talk about the standard tier, it's backed by the SLA, which is called uptime SLA. This is again, getting the resiliency. So for production workload, highly recommended, you use the standard tier with the uptime SLA, which will provide you 99.995% high availability if you are using AZ. And if you're not, if you're using non-AZ, then, Three lines. This is very important to consider. And another aspect, and this is the big trouble. Um, I am actually working with one of the big customer. I can't name it, but they are using the networking. Um, so um, they have a big AK shared cluster, and they run out of IP addresses. And this is, I think, very common problem. So one of the, if we're talking about the resiliency and availability, we should use the, of course, the CNI, but with the dynamic or CLI overlay. This gives you the freedom of IP addresses and uh, allocation, especially with the overlay, CNA overlay, because with the CNA overlay, your pod IP address allocation will be from the different side range than the node pod, uh, node IP address range. So you will have more freedom. Another, uh, some of the more design considerations, um, V5 VM SKU we should use. Uh, this just the best practice to use V5. Uh, V5. Premium disk to achieve uh, four nines. Uh, zone redundancy, of course, um, as I said, like if you are using cluster with a high available, but if, the, if your disk is not highly available, then you're gonna have a problem. So you should be considering the zone redundant disk because it provides you the redundancy, synchronous update into three zones. Enable container inside to have the monitoring of, of uh, know what is happening inside your cluster and use the Azure, Azure policy to enforce security and compliance requirement of your AKS cluster. Actually, I have a lot actually, seriously. I did not realize I have a lot of slides for the design, design consideration. Okay, regional level. Um, ingress, of course, you, you, um, you more, of course, for a production workload, you use the ingress. So for ingress, um, what this is saying is run multiple instances of ingress controller. Either use app gateway ingress controller or use app gateway as a, you know, as a like um, as a front end to the AKS cluster. In either case, you should use uh, multiple instances so that you will have the high availability and use the standard load balancer if you're not using uh, app gateway ingress controller. It this is mostly required for the multi AZ. So I will I have a slide we will just to touch base on that when we talk about the multi AZ. So I need should have a mechanism to route the traffic to which AZ it should go. So you should use the standard load balancer. Um, Okay, so when we talk about the global level, so if I have onto two regions, Sydney and Melbourne, 
let's say, then I should have a mechanism to route the traffic to either Sydney or Melbourne. So there are two services. One is called Traffic Manager. This is layer layer four load um, load balancer, TCP layer four. Or if I need the TCP layer seven load balancer, then I can, I can use the front door. What it provides is not only the layer seven, which is you can we all know that you can use the path based routing or post based routing. It also provides the WAF built in WAF plus DDoS protection as well. Uh, also, I need to consider the ACR geo replication. So, if I'm using the multi region, then you know that um, if I'm deploying my ACR images into the Sydney region, then I can just turn on the replication, geo replication. So, it will start replicating into Melbourne as well. So, then if I deploy my cluster to the Melbourne, then it will go and read the images from the Melbourne. So, that if the Sydney region is down, I may, my images will be available into Melbourne region as well. So this is again another design important design consideration, just showing you how the application works. Okay, now multi-zone cluster. I'm just checking if, how much time I have. Oh, 15 minutes, I think. 15. Yeah, I have to rush. Okay, now I will cover some of the deployment pattern. Um, one is the multi-zone cluster deployment pattern, and I have a multi-region deployment pattern as well. So let's touch this on that. Multi zone. So I will skip the slide, just uh, giving you that what this um, AZ is. I already covered what the concept of availability zone. Uh, I go to the next one. This is just showing that deployment pattern that if I have, let's say, uh, if I deploy to multiple region, let's say uh, this is a deploying into the multi AZ and I have a geo replication enabled. So this is deploying like a multi region. This is showing that within the region, I have a three AZs. Is one of the AZs down, then other two are available, then my application will be up and running. Now, let's talk about the AKS deployment with availability zone. So, as I, touched, as I said that, as I said that you know, when I deploy to AK, my AKS cluster, I can select the availability zone, that which availability zone I want to deploy. Let's say I deploy to three availability zone. So I will have a node spread across three AZs. If one of the AZs is down, the other nodes will be up and running. And this is, again, one of the design considerations that I should spread my application across the availability zone as well. I should not have application, all three instances running on zone two in this case, then if the zone two is down, all three instances will be down. So in that case, I should have one instance here, one instance here, and one instance here. So if the zone two is down, I should not worry because of zone one and three will be up and running. So what's going to happen in this case is if the Kubernetes find out that, okay, this is, this is it's down and this port should be running three instances, but it is running actually two instances, the schedule will go and spin up the another port. So if it does not find this one, then it will go and spin up in any of these uh, nodes. But you, are, you will guarantee to have three nodes. But in this case, since the one AZ is down, but you will still have at least two AZ, uh, two port in one and one port in another. Similarly, when we talk about multi AZ deployment, we should have a standard, we should have a zone redundant load balancer. Because this is three separate data centers or, or physically separated locations when we talk about the AZ. So that means that you should have some mechanism to route the traffic to the respective AZ. And the way we achieve is through the load balancer. Again, this is config. I don't have to go and do a lot of work to spin up this load balancer. When I do this with the portal or within the like a CLI, I can just spin up the load balancer, it will go and do it. I just need to select the zone redundant load balancer. It will be fronted by the one single IP and will start out with traffic to each of the AZ. Uh, so this is within the within the region. Within the region, not across the region. So ingress gateway you're talking about. Ingress gateway is for layer seven, but you need to have, you can use the app gateway uh, as ingress uh, app gateway here to route the traffic. But this will give you layer seven for, app gateway will give you layer seven. So if you go to down the part as well, you can use the row zone redundant app gateway. Yeah. Yeah, you can use the app gateway for that. Okay, so this is showing um, node pool spanning AZ. 
So this is showing that I have three AZ and I can deploy two node pools spanning up across the AZ. So this is just a deployment pattern I'm showing you. So one deployment pattern, three AZs, and one node pool spanning across the node, uh, three node, node uh, availability zone. Uh, advantage of this approach is that I will have a less node pool, but I could have a more resource contention into one of the AZ as well. Because uh, as you can see here, maybe I can have more pods running into one node, uh, one zone, but the less pod running onto the other, uh, another one. So the, one of the downsides of this. Another design pattern is a node pool per AZ. So this is like a three AZs and I can do mix and match. So this one is just a node pool spread across three AZ, but I can have a node pool per AZ. So this AZ and I have a node pool. I can do that as well. This is again for the specialized workload. If I want to have, let's say, um, nodes, uh, the ports within the ports are running close to each other to minimize the latency, for example, then I can use this pattern. So node pool per, uh, the disadvantage of this is that I, I may end up more node pools. <clears throat> Another approach I have is run a case with multiple cluster. So AZ per cluster. This is another design pattern. So I, I talk about three. One is that uh, node pool is spread across multi, uh, AZ. Another one is node pool per AZ. And third one is cluster per AZ. Again, this depends upon the requirement, what sort of requirement you have, but some of the patterns you can do. But in this case, you're going to have three independent control planes. Of course, because each cluster will have its own control plane. And if you do this choice, like, you know, the one which is the multi um, one AZ per cluster, then you should have some sort of mechanism to route the traffic. You can either use traffic manager or front door to route the traffic if you have this scenario. Okay, now, so we finish up the discussion of multi AZ deployment. This one is about multi region cluster. So multi AZM is within the region. I have multi availability zone, but within, for example, Sydney region, I am deploying only in Sydney region and I'm deploying into multiple AZs within the Sydney region. This is about, I want to deploy Sydney and Melbourne region, or if I am in US, I want to deploy, let's say three regions or four regions in US, for example, because I have a highly Michigan critical, or highly, I need to have a highly available application. So, some of the design patterns, some of the design considerations, for example, minimize downtime, reduce downtime risk, and reduce RTO. Uh, you can use active active, or you can use the active standby. Some of my customers they are using active active. Some of the big banks, you know, that, that means they're routing send the traffic to both of them. You know, depending upon where the customer is, if the customer is near to Melbourne, send to Melbourne, near to Sydney, send to Melbourne, Sydney. Or they can do the active standby in which one is active, other is like a, for example, a DR scenario. They keep it standby. If this one is down, they start out in the traffic, change the load balancer, drive the traffic to the other region. Uh, things need to consider application state. Of course, you, if you have application state, they need to replicate those. And you need to use some sort of services which can replicate the state. For example, if you are using the Cosmos DB, right? And let's say if I want to do multi region, then you can use the Cosmos DB multi-region support to, to replicate to the different regions. Um, of course, the backup and other consideration and image registry, we already talked about that in the, in the multi-region scenario. Now the deployment practices is, okay, I will say skip the slide front door uh, we, because we already touched base on that one. This is just showing you that if I have a multi-region, this is region one and region two. And this is showing I'm using two traffic manager and front door. And front door I'm using for the layer four, so this is layer four. This is routing the traffic to the app service instances, uh, using the pass based routing, and also to the um, to this MAC cluster, uh, sorry, it's the VMs, uh, front by the app gateway. And also I can use the traffic manager to route the traffic layer four, uh, use as a layer four load balancer at the region level. This is the deployment pattern. If I'm using multiple cluster with the same reason, we already touched base on that. I have AZ1, AZ2, I deployed on those. I will use the traffic manager front door, 
But if I'm using across the multi cross region, then this is region one, region two, and I can use the traffic manager front door to route the traffic. Uh, this is just showing you that how I can use the front door and API and app gateway to do the blue green deployment. I can do the mix and match, for example. You know, for example, in my Sydney region, this is my um, Sydney and this is my Melbourne region. Sydney region, I have two clusters. One I'm using as a blue, one I'm using as a green. And similarly for Melbourne, I'm using one as a green, one is blue. So what, what I have to do is that uh, if the traffic is coming through here, then and I'm deploying the blue, then you can just route the traffic through through the load balancer through that gateway here, and you start routing the traffic to here. And you can use that kind of uh, weighted routing and all sort of thing through that gateway. So this is just showing you the one of the deployment pattern um, to make it cl cluster highly available. Okay, so now network latency, I just quickly go. Uh, some of the network latency requirement. So you, in most of the case, some of the cases, you know, you want to reduce the latency. Like if you have a high performant uh, application and you're running the multiple pods or like, for example, if one instance needs to uh, interact with another microservice, for example, and you need to reduce the latency, then you need some sort of mechanism to do that. So if you do across the multi-region or multi-AZ, then you may introduce more latency. So what we do in this case is we deploy the multi-AZ deployment with topo, uh, topology aware routing, node pool per zone. So you remember that we, dis, um, we when we look at the deployment uh, pattern, multi-AZ deployment pattern, one of the pattern is that you do the node pool per AZ so in this case, you can do node pool per AZ so that you will deploy all the relevant um, ports or microservices for that your application into the one AZ. And with the way you would do is using the node selector. Another technique is you use, use the proximity uh, placement group. Um, the proximity placement group is that this is the guarantee that your workload will be deployed uh, onto close to uh, within the one region, uh, sorry, within one AZ. Um, this is the config, um, and this works only on the si uh, single AZ, not the across the multiple AZ. So looks less look at the deployment pattern. Um, just skip this one. I already covered this one. So again, deployment pattern for using the PPG, uh, PPG or proximity 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 uh, placement group. So you can see here, I have three AZ, and if I need to reduce the latency, what I would do is just deploy into the uh, node pool which will be onto the multi single AZ and uh, these ports are close to each other. So this is what the PPG is. So the, the ports will be deployed close to each other to so reduce the latency. Or I can use uh, one cluster per AZ. I mean this is another another deployment pattern we talk about. So uh, either I deploy node pool per AZ or I deploy cluster per AZ. So this is again Another one, and I can I de in this case I deployed cluster per AZ, and within the AZ I define the PPG. And this again is similar to the previous one. Uh, if you do that, then you need to route the traffic to the traffic manager front door. Now application resiliency requirement. I think I have five minutes. Yeah. Um, quickly go into it. Um, one of the uh, very famous case study of the airline in which the system was highly available. They had like uh, they deployed application across not only the infrastructure, for example, they had servers, multiple, multiple VMs, disk was redundant, you know, multiple disk. Uh, DR was perfectly designed, 30 mile away DR, you know, in case of any failure, it was like active, active, everything was perfect. But what happened was that there was a small exception in the application. An applica exception was that the application was served by the IVR and the um, IVR and the chaos, you know, that when the ticketing system, you know, we can use the boarding pass. So the connectivity, the, the application, backend application connects to the database and the, the connection, there was an exception and the connection, the connection pool was resource exhausted, and that cascaded the failure all the way top, and it burned, bring down the whole system for hours and hours, and it costed the airline thousands of dollars. So the moral of the story is that 
even if you design the system perfect, you know, infrastructure is good, everything is good, everything is redundant, but have you considered your application to be resilient? That's the, that's the main issue. So, think here is that when you deploy your application, this is a typical application we all deploy, right? The bunch of microservices, front by the API gateway, some sort of API gateway. Then we use the databases and our messaging and other databases, things here. So there are a lot of moving parts here that we need to consider. I go to the next one now. Some of the patterns that we need to consider when we talk about the application uh, resiliency. Things like retry, things like circuit breaker. In that airline example, if the circuit breaker was implemented, then the more requests would not be coming and the whole system would not be down. Similarly, like a bulkhead, bulkhead is another pattern which I can isolate the failure. Another apply, applicable to airline example. Similarly, cache, fallback, rate limiting, throttling, CQRS, pub, pub sub, back end for front end. So these are the sum of the res common resiliency pattern that should be incorporated into application. And unfortunately, like if you look at the on microservices that people are designing these days, they're saying we are designing microservices, but they're just deploying the big monolith application, which does not take care of all of this. So again, this just shows that how retry works and how the circuit breaker works. I just go to the next one. I touch base on the chaos engineering. Like uh, this is about testing for the failure. Some of the common frameworks available, uh, Azure Chaos Studio is there, some plus some of the other. Um, chaos engineering, again, as I said, embracing the failure. It's not avoiding the failure, embracing the failure, and design the system for the failure. Uh, from some of the libraries available, uh, for libraries we can use, specifically for AKS, when you use the Azure Chaos Engineering, they, these are the, like a, some of the faults that you can inject and you can test against those faults. Stress testing is very important. Uh, this is how we would know how your system will work in a production environment. So I give the example of three, like for example, three instances, three AZ. But what if, if that not, would not be sufficient? I always you know, get the question from my customer saying that, how many instances should I run? I say, okay, let's do the stress testing of the full production load. Then we will find out. Let's run what we anticipate. Let's say three instances. Let's do the stress testing. Then we will find out how many stresses would I need. That is the best way to find out. And there are a lot of common frameworks available uh, for the stress testing. All right. I think we'll have to we'll have to wrap there, unfortunately, because yeah, we've got to keep okay. we've got to keep the time with with a couple of sessions running. So um, I'm sure Irfan's going to be around. If you've got any questions off the back yeah. of your session, apologies for interrupting, but uh, we've got folks coming in from the other room already. Did anyone ask you any questions during your talk? Uh, I've got one question. <laughs> Who, yep. All right. There we are. Whoops. So if uh, I think that gentleman's got more than one pair or more than one price, so if someone else would like it, um, please go and see him. Um, Look, we are going to do a quick tech 